Okay, awesome. Well, I know this is a small group, um, so I'll keep it very informal, but uh, most of you know me. I am uh, Rina Patel. I'm the founder of SHE. Uh, really, the mission behind SHE is to create a holistic support network work for female identifying teens to get the support that they need in their lives, whether it's mental health related, academic related. Um, our core focus is really just creating a space that all of us probably wish we had before we were adults and arming the next generation with the tools that they need to succeed. Um, one of the things that we're really focused on doing is bringing in services and resources that are traditionally inaccessible, either because because they're too expensive or it takes too much time to find them or maybe parents just don't know where to go to find them. So um, that's one of the reasons why we're bringing in Sawyer and Jessica because they have so much knowledge that I think our, sometimes our school systems don't provide or you know, sometimes Google can't answer all of our questions. So um, that, is, that is kind of a quick summary of, of what we're doing. Uh, we just launched uh, our wait list for our app. Um, so it'll be, uh, a gathering place for the teens in our community, but also hopefully for our parents to engage and get the resources that they need for their for their teens. Um, so I'm going to go into my my brief introduction of Jessica and Sawyer, and I'll let you both introduce yourselves too. I'm just going to read a little bit of your background, um, and then Carla, I would we would love to hear from you, hear your questions. We have a list of other questions that some parents had submitted, so we can go into those as well. Um, so Jessica is an independent college counselor with over a decade of experience in academia and helping students navigate the college admissions process. She also spent four years conducting research at the University of Colorado Boulder's Institute of Behavioral Science and the prior two years working as an operations research analyst for the U.S. Army at the TRADOC, is that the best way to say it? TRADOC Anal Analysis Center in White Sands Missile Range, uh, New Mexico. Uh, Jessica graduated from Chapman University with a BA in psychology. Um, in addition to being an independent counselor, Jessica also serves as a college and career counselor for the Living Wisdom High School based in Palo Alto, California. Uh, there's obviously a lot more to that, so I'll, I'll let you get into that. And then Sawyer uh, Earwood is an education professional who has worked in both college, admission off college admissions offices and small startups. His admissions experience has taken him across the USA and Asia. During his tenure at the Assistant Director of Enrollment at Hendricks College, he managed the university's enrollment coaching program and recruited domestic and international students. As a first generation college student, he is passionate about the transformative power of education and the pursuit of equity in the world. Awesome. So I will leave it to the both of you. And uh, maybe, Carla, we can just go into some of your questions right after. Hi, so um, my daughter is entering her senior year of high school. Um, and I think I, I think I only posted one question and that was, I noticed that a lot of the colleges aren't requiring SATs. Like I think she has like a really strong GPA. Um, she took her SATs, I think she did okay, but she's taking it again in October. Um, and so my question is, how much does that really weigh? Like, is it a big thing if we don't include it? Should we include it even if it's not necessary? So there, you're not gonna like this answer because the answer is it depends, which is the answer for like most questions in college admissions. Um, basically what it comes down to is every school operates differently and reads applications differently. Even colleges who say they do holistic application readings, that looks different across the board. What we've found, especially last year, when you know the majority of the country was test optional, mm -hmm. was if you have solid test scores, if you have high test scores, if your test scores are within that middle 50% range of admitted students or above, um, that benefits students in the process. Okay. But we also found that our students who applied test optional to incredibly competitive institutions still fared very well. Um, some colleges need the scores to offer financial aid and scholarship money. So that's okay. worth checking just in case. And states like Georgia and Florida have mandated that the public institutions require test scores still. So it's good to have them. I hope she can retest in October because usually when a student wants to retest, it's because they don't feel their scores reflective of their ability, which mm -hmm. these scores are meaningless. Um, they're not 
a defining factor for any student. Um, but tests are being canceled still. So like there's a fine balance. Um, if she's proud of her score and that's within that range for each institution, it's worth submitting. If it's not, then it's worth having a conversation about where to submit and where to maybe withhold the score. Um, okay. Because there, I mean, some of my students last year who had pretty low scores, like definitely not reflective of their ability at all. Mm -hmm. um, when they went test optional, they wound up being awarded a lot more scholarship money at some schools than my students who did submit higher scores than they had. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting balance, but yeah. the test optional thing isn't new. Like Bowdoin was test optional in 1969. Like it's new that so many schools are pushing for it this year, but it's certainly not like a new thing. And I would, I would only add to that because Jess summed it up very well. Um, one thing I will say is I'm going to put a, a link in the chat. And for those who can't click the chat because you're watching this later, I'll describe what it is. Um, so there is an organization called NACAC, so the National Association of College Admission Counseling. <laughs> it's kind of like the governing body of anybody who works in admissions or college counseling. Um, they had a push towards um, kind of the beginning of COVID when it became more difficult for tests to be had, um, mm -hmm. where the general idea is test optional actually means test optional, um, because there are some schools that will do test optional for admissions, but they won't think about scholarships if you do test optional. Um, so like there's some schools that kind of have, have ridden the good faith of the test optional train or wagon, but really they are not doing it intentionally and they're not really living up to that promise. Um, here's a, they have a list on the website um, of about 500 plus schools that have actually like really committed and signed and put their name out there as institutions that do really mean if you apply without a test score, we will not look at that test score. We won't dig deeper to find some secret hidden test score and you're not gonna get penalized because you didn't submit a test score. So those are um, a really great way to start if you're thinking about a student that is maybe not happy with their test or have been unable to take the test or maybe just has like you know, testing anxiety or something. So they're not performing as strongly as they might want to. Um, this is a really good kind of area to start looking at seeing what colleges are out there that have openly committed to test optional. Thanks. Definitely take a look at that. There's also, this is going to get complicated. Um, sorry, do you mind finding our blog post about the difference between test optional and test blind? Um, there's so many different terms that mean so many different things across the board and there's no consistency, which is infuriating, um, even as counselors. Um, so one thing to consider is a lot of schools that are test optional still want test scores but for a different purpose so they might not use it in admissions but they might request the test scores later to help students test into the appropriate class so like if your math score is high enough or your english score is high enough there's a chance a student might be able to test in like out of one of their like basic writing classes okay. or basic okay. math classes um so again like it's actually it's worth taking the test if she has the time and energy to take it again and actually wants to, but if it's just gonna be like torturesome and overwhelming and impact her negatively in other ways, then it's not worth it. Yeah, she definitely wants to do it again. She thinks yeah. she can do better, so okay. good to know. Thank you. Yeah. So the other question that I think, I think um, Carla, you had also asked this one um, was about the, um, the college essay. Mm -hmm. Um, what are advisors looking for in the college essay or what are admissions looking for? Yeah, I was about to say, so this is very common, especially this time of year, because um, it's, I think a lot of students are realizing that like the summer is kind of raced by and school's starting and or about to start. Um, so what are we looking for in the college essay? There's so many, like there, there's entire empires that have been built off the idea of like, how do you write a college essay? So I really want to be kind of like surface level and talk about what I consider kind of like the building blocks or like the scaffolding to help a student build that essay. Um, 
So one of the most important things that I really want students to remember, and we talk about this a lot with students, is your essay is one of the few times through your entire application process where you actually can control and deliver a message directly to the admissions counselor. Um, your activities list, I mean, you can describe what you do, but it's only 150 characters. So like you don't have a lot of room to really talk about like values or why you did it. It's really a lot more like a resume. Um, your transcript is, you know, kind of set in stone and there's not a lot of description there. Test scores, the same kind of thing. Um, so really like the essay and any smaller essays are going to be the ones that really will make a huge difference when you speak to an admission counselor. So what are we looking for? Um, I think it might be easier to maybe talk about what we aren't looking for that we see happen a lot. Um, we don't want a reiteration of your resume or activities list. Um, this, the counselor already has that. They don't need to know all the cool things you've done. Ideally, they've already seen that. If you want to mention them during the essay as examples of things, um, that's totally valid. Um, something else we don't want to see, um, do not try and write something because you think the admission officer wants to read it because that's the easiest way to get lumped into a whole group of students who write the exact same things because they are all writing exactly what they think the admission officer wants to read. Um, I'll, I will tell you as someone who's read a lot of essays, um, I am always way more excited to read an essay that is original, something that talks to the student's personality, their character, it's written in their voice, I can see their beliefs and values. Those are all the things I want um, because I don't need to know how smart you are. I don't need to know everything you do. I got all that. I got your transcripts and test scores. So that's something we really work with students. And that's honestly my favorite part of the process is taking us just taking some time looking in inside of yourself and kind of reflecting on like, who am I? What matters to me? What's important to me? What do I want to do in the world? Not like what major do I want or what job do I want? Because those change pretty rapidly. Um, but like, you know, what problems do I want to solve? What do I care about? And that's really where you get those good essays. And it can be something as simple. And we've gotten a lot of different essays. Um, some of our favorite essays seem really silly or mundane, but they have obviously stuck with us. Um, one of my favorites was from a, a past student who was asked to describe herself to her, her upcoming roommate. Um, and she had a long, elaborate metaphor describing herself as a fried egg. Um, and it was unbelievable, just like to, to take something so unique and original, but it was also very personal. I felt like I knew her after reading that. And that's exactly what you want. Um, so a lot of students think like, oh man, you know, I, I have to create a startup or I have to go save the penguins or like stop global warming or cure cancer. You absolutely do not. You can talk about going to a farmer's market with a family member. You can talk about a pet that was really instrumental in like helping you grow as a person. Um, a lot of times talk about a time where your life was hard and how did you grow from it? Um, that's another one I would say that I caution students against is sometimes students go for like a sob story and they do it not maliciously, but because it was an impactful moment. The, the sob part of story should be maybe like 25% of an essay. The other 75% is like, how did you overcome it? How did you grow from it? And how are you different now because of it? Um, so those are like some of the first things I think about is oftentimes it's a lot easier for an essay to start off by not saying, what do you want to write about? But like, what is the message you want to send the admission officer? What are the values that matter to you? What do you want them to walk away remembering? And once you have those kinds of concepts decently understood, you can think of experiences and memories and things that you've been involved with that will lead you naturally to that conclusion. So it's almost like you're starting at the end rather than the beginning, but that has really helped a lot of our students. I put our blog posts about the topics to avoid in there. Um, we've seen some of these topics work well when it's done well, but it has to be particularly unique. Um, otherwise it's something that the admission officer probably won't keep reading after the first couple sentences. Um, yeah. So that's usually a helpful place to start. I was about to say, and a note on that really quickly too, is a lot of students, for example, um, notorious in the college admissions world is the sports essay, um, which is typically frowned upon. 
Um, but one of the things I like to talk with students about is some students are like, oh, well, I'm not going to write about sports. Well, it's, it's not that you can't write about sports. It's that there are a couple different topics that tend to have the same pitfall. So when we think of um, like uh, mission trips or sporting events, things like those, what ends up happening is something that can be really difficult for students is that students need to remember they are the star of this essay. Um, and especially for students who have like been humble and not like braggadocious for their entire life, that can be a really hard concept of like humbly and appropriately bragging about themselves. But one of the things that some of those students will, will kind of fall into is if you write about a sports game or you write about a mission trip, you tend to focus on an event rather than yourself. Um, and that's where it kind of falls apart because you wanna tell this story, but you're just a person in the story. You are not the star. Um, and that is really where it falls apart. The other thing that oftentimes happens with like service trips is students will talk about how they went on this service trip. It was super impactful. It was unbelievable. It changed their life. And then I look at what they did when they came back from it and they didn't help anybody like ever again after that one trip. And so like as an admission officer, I have to wonder, I'm like, okay, well, that seemed like a really impactful thing, but you know, for somebody who claimed your life was changed and like you wanted to give back to your community, you sure didn't do that once you got back. So like, there's a little bit of a disparity there. So um, when we say things that people are tired about reading, we always take that with a grain of salt. It's just, they have common pitfalls, but if you want to write about them and you do it in an appropriate fashion, they can also be super compelling essays. I think ultimately the essay is the only chance for the student to actually connect with the reader. Like your transcript's already done. She's already a senior they won't see her grades until she chooses a college. So like her transcript's done. Her activities list is also done. Like she's participated in things and just needs to explain them in a very brief, short space, 150 characters, half a tweet. Um, and then that's like, that's already two thirds of the, of the process and the rest is the essays. And the person on the other end reading it, and I think students don't actually realize this, most of them just graduated college. They're like barely older than these kids who are applying. And it's actually really easy to connect with the person on the other side because it's an actual person on the other side. Um, so like, it's totally fine to, we, we want students to be authentic and genuine. Like if you're funny, be funny. If you're serious, be serious. But the easiest essays to write are the ones that are about something the student either loves or knows a lot about. And that's what makes it compelling for the reader because it's, when you're able to hear that student's voice or able to connect with that student in some way, even if it's just like, I played that video game too, that's sometimes enough for it to be memorable when it comes down between your student and another student with a very similar transcript and activities list who gets the, who gets in. It's the one that they actually can relate to. But of course, you never know who's on the other end and you also don't know when they're reading it. It could be, you know, 7 a.m. on a Monday morning or 5 p.m. on a Friday. And some of those might be more of a sweet spot than others. Super helpful. Thank you both. Yeah, no worries. Great questions. Very common too. So you are not alone in, in the anxiety behind all of that. <laughs> um, one of our, our last questions, well, we had two more questions. The first one was, um, what are examples of success and failures of, admission, of the admissions process? Right. So, yeah, I was about to say, so this is, this is a pretty wide, wide ranging question, but I think how I would interpret this, because I tend to be more of like a prescriptive person. So like, I'm one of those people where if somebody like writes a self-help book and it's just them talking the entire time, I don't want that. I want like, I want check boxes. I want guides. I want lists. I want strategies and structure. So what I would say is like, here are some ways that you can maybe help be successful in the college search process and some ways to maybe avoid that stress or, or failure in the college application process. Um, and some of this will seem super obvious, but maybe if you hear it from enough people, you'll, you'll take me up on it. Um, but uh, the first thing, first and foremost, starting early. And when I say start early, I'm not talking about ninth grade or 10th grade. I'm not one of those people that like is currently pushing to like have 12 year olds get ready to apply to college. Um, I mean, like, start thinking about college lists, start doing a little bit of research, maybe your junior year, 
junior year spring, maybe really start to like outline and start to actually make some physical steps towards like getting some of these things assembled, talk to people about letters of recommendation. And then over the summer, like do some essay work. You, it's not gonna take your entire summer. If you dedicate one hour a week to essays each week for the entire summer, you will be done way before summer is over. Um, and if you can do all that, here is, here is my reward in this scenario. My reward is a senior year where you can actually spend time with friends, where you can focus on those harder classes and those extracurriculars you're involved in, where you can talk with your family without it turning into an argument over the dinner table or in the car over college stuff. Um, and you can remove pretty much all the stress of the college application process until maybe January or February when you start getting acceptance letters back. And if you can just start early and do a little bit along the way, it will make it so much easier. Um, the other thing I will add in there, and I know Jess probably has a, a lot more, so I wanna give her some time and we'll probably bounce back and forth off each other as well. Um, I cannot really emphasize how important it is to find a college that is a good fit. Um, and people use that term a lot, good fit. And it used to drive me crazy as a teenager because most people either can't define it or they are like, oh, it's just that gut feeling you get when you walk onto a college. But what happens when you visit five colleges and none of them give you that gut feeling? Um, it makes you feel like you're never gonna find that place that is a good fit or there might not be a good fit out there for you. And that's not true. So when we talk about fit with students and parents and families, we talk about things like academics. So is it going to be challenging, but not uh, abysmal and miserable? Um, we want students to have a place where they're going to be pushed, but not a place where they're going to sacrifice their mental or physical health or social life to make that happen. Um, do they offer academics that you're interested in? So majors are things that get talked about a lot, but if you have a specific interest, do they have avenues for you to explore that? create your own major, do interdisciplinary studies. Maybe you wanna be a doctor, but also you like history. I want you to go to a place where you can do both of those. Um, finances, finances are huge. And, and unfortunately how the structure is right now, colleges don't want to talk about finances until the end of the process. And what happens a lot of time is students find these schools, they fall in love with them, they apply to them. Everybody says, we'll make it work. And then there's a realization either right before it's time to decide where we have that hard conversation that it's not gonna work or perhaps even worse in my opinion, uh, students and families decide they're gonna make it work and they put all their effort into making it work for one year, not realizing that there's three possibly more expensive years down the line. Um, and then you end up where you're either going to have to transfer, or you're gonna have to drop out and it just is a nightmare for everybody, including the institution. Um, so thinking about that geographic area, distance from home, what's the campus culture like? What's the vibe? Are you a social butterfly and you want to be like all out in everywhere knowing everyone? Are you an introvert and maybe you want to be a little bit more kind of a smaller friend group or you don't want to be in the spotlight? Big schools, small schools, the list goes on and on. My point being is why is this important? Because one of the things that we do not talk about enough in the college search is that you can go to college, you can get a great education, you can get an awesome jump start on a career, and you can be happy. I wanna let that third one sit in. Happy is not used enough in this college search process. If you find a place where you feel supported, where you're happy, where you can wake up at 8 a.m. for a stats class and still be happy where you are, that is the place where you're gonna succeed because maybe 20% of the time in college is spent in a classroom the rest is spent with clubs and organizations. It's spent with friends. It's spent growing and exploring as a person. If you are happy, you're gonna do better inside the classroom and outside the classroom. And you're probably gonna be a healthier person overall. So that's kind of one of my big things would just be start early and really take some time to figure out what you're looking for in a college. Um, don't just go somewhere because your friend or your boyfriend or your girlfriend are deciding to go there. That's almost always universally a recipe for disaster. Um, and don't go somewhere just because you like the football team or you like the soccer team, unless you're playing for them, I guess. Um, 
but that's my two things. Start early and fit is really important. So make sure you know what you're looking for in colleges. Yeah, and it's not too late to start. Like no students behind right now. Most schools haven't even started yet for the year. Um, and most seniors, you know, spend their fall semester doing this process. I think what it boils down to is making sure that they're setting aside a chunk of time where it doesn't feel overwhelming because they know the only time they have to think about college is this hour on this day every week until it's done. Um, and that's kind of the best way to do it. Also pro tip for families, um, set aside, 30 to 45 minutes, maybe an hour each week to have the college talk. And that is the only time when parents can ask questions. And the only time where students have to answer those questions, it will save you some serious heartache throughout the last year at home. Um, just having that time set aside because then students are prepared to be responsive and much more likely to engage. Um, and then parents don't have to nag all the time, knowing that there is this moment in time where they're allowed to ask every question and they have to be answered. Um, but also to, to answer the failure part of the admission process, um, there's two or three huge like red flag failure type things that we try to avoid. One being applying to schools that aren't in good fit. Um, that tends to be the students who either are shooting for the stars at these incredibly ultra selective, we call them highly rejective institutions, um, when they're not actually a qualified applicant for it, or that's the only thing on their list and that's a huge problem. We, we need balance for that reason. Um, so, I mean, that comes down to academic fit. Um, partly, and the other part is admissions is not as cut and dry as people think. Um, when you know Harvard's reporting an admission rate of 4%, what they're really reporting is an admission rate of less than one because half that class is already filled with athletes and legacy students. So it leaves even fewer spots for the rest of us. Um, and that's just an example. That's hundreds of schools are like that. Um, other failures though are um, students feeling like they can only look at schools that they've heard of not being open-minded. The biggest failure is to be not open-minded. There are schools out there for everyone. There's like over 4,000 colleges in the U.S. alone. There's a lot. Um, there is a good fit for quite literally every student. And I think there, we talk to students all the time about this. Students only want to apply to schools that they've heard of. And it's very hard to kind of like open their minds to what exists out there. And I get it. I totally understand it. And I was the same way as a, as a teenager. Like if you had told me that there's this wonderful little liberal arts institution in Conway, Arkansas, that would be a great fit for me. I would have said, <laughs> yeah, right. I was coming from San Diego. There was no way, but I wish I had gone there. Um, and like knowing what I know now, I would say like being open-minded is how you can be successful in this process. And that is being open-minded about maybe choosing that bigger school because there's a really good honors program and you're, you know, top of the class there or choosing that smaller school to be the big fish in the small pond because that might help you stand out for med school applications. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other like major failures in this process besides just like falling in love with a school you'll never be able to afford applying anyway, thinking that you'll make it work and ultimately having to make a really hard choice to not go there because no 18 year old should commit to taking on like $250,000 in debt for an undergraduate degree. If they have that kind of money, they really should just be buying a house. <laughs> Let's I'll step off I'll, that soapbox. I'll add a quick failure in there that you reminded me of, uh, since I talked a lot about like how to success. Um, one thing that I really want to reiterate to students, families, anybody who sees this, um, when you get rejected from a college, that is not a failure. Um, it feels like it. And no matter what I tell you, you probably won't agree with me until you get some more life experience under your belt. But I want to let you know, as somebody who's been on the other side of that desk, the difference between the person who gets denied pretty much after the first read and the person who gets denied at the very last minute and it's down to a 50-50 chance between them and someone else, on paper, they're both denied. No one knows the difference. Um, and so I want you to remember that, one, if you are denied or not offered uh, acceptance, you don't know how far you made it in that process. Um, so you have no idea how well you did. The other thing I really want to reiterate is that what you do 
is not what ends up making the decision. Um, there's something, a term called institutional priorities, and that is always going to be the bottom line for decision making. So, for example, if, um, if we're losing a quarterback at a particular college and somebody is applying and they are a quarterback, that person's probably going to get a little bit more of preference because they are needed by the college. If a college is pushing to get a student from every state, then like the Dakotas, Nebraska, Wyoming, those areas where it is very hard to get students from, um, those are probably going to get preferential treatment to a certain extent. Um, a college should never admit a student that's not going to succeed at their school. Um, that's a whole nother thing is I've gotten this a lot where people are like, well, if you deny a student, like you're, you're really just telling them they're awful or like that all admission counselors are like gatekeepers on ego trips, like with this power power dynamic. Um, if I have ever denied a student, there's only one of two reasons. One, which is exceptionally rare, there are significant red flags in the application. And by significant to put to rest most students and parents' worries, I'm talking about where like there is a liability or a danger for that student coming to campus. Um, that is one, and that has almost never happened during the time that I've been in admissions. The second one, and much more common, is I don't think you can actually succeed at the school. And that doesn't mean there aren't good schools out there for you, but what it means is I don't want you to go through all this hard work. I don't want you to scrounge together as much money as you can find. I don't want you to uproot your entire life, tell everybody you're going to college, and, and then get there and fail out. That is just a travesty to me. Um, and that is not to say that like kids beneath the 50% don't get into college. By definition, the middle 50% is that middle 50. There's 25 above it and there's 25% below it. Um, there are students who did not do well in math, but I don't care so much because they're going to be art history majors or they're theater majors. And like a C in a math class is not what I think their life is going to amount to. Um, so that's something I really want everybody to realize is that it's really hard to feel that rejection. Um, it's hard to feel rejection at any point in your life. Um, but rest assured, if you are denied, it is because of either the institutional priorities that are outside of your control, or it is because there was a doubt as to whether you would succeed or not, and that might feel unfair, but they're doing it out of the best interest for you, your family, and the institution. Um, so denial is really hard, but it's also one of those things where it is not your fault and it does not have value on who you are or what you're going to accomplish in your life. I think it's also really important to remind these students like over and over and over that the decisions that are made, it's not actually a rejection in that like you're not being accepted or rejected. You're either being offered admission or not offered admission. Um, like it's that's really the only way to say it. It's like buying a concert ticket. You want to try to get tickets to, you know, like Radiohead and you log in and you wait in that, like whatever waiting room they have there for hours on end, hoping for a ticket when they were really sold out in half a second. Like it's half of this is luck. Half of it is having your application read by the right person at the right time. And that is, that is it. Thank you. That was really, really uh, encouraging and then also very informational. Um, Carla, did you have any any other questions? I had one more, but I know this one wasn't a question from you, so I wanted to. Yeah, I just actually was asking my husband, um, what what are your thoughts or how's the what's the best way to handle um, when you do what is it um, like early acceptance round one round two? Like, What are your thoughts on that? So a few things. There's a lot of terms here. Sorry, will you find the, that one blog post that explains? <laughs> um, so early decision is a binding agreement, meaning if you are admitted early decision, you have to go. They expect that families understand the financial repercussions of that decision going into it. Um, it is a contract that the student, the parents, and the school counselor signs. If you get out of an early decision agreement without a legitimate reason, like a huge change in financial circumstance is really kind of the only legitimate financial reason, um, that will hinder other students' abilities to get into that school at all, from your high school, from your district, from your state. Um, it's a huge problem because colleges are trying to build relationships with schools um, because 
when, when they know how a school educates a student, they know that student can do well in their school. Makes sense. Um, early action tends to be non-binding. There are some nuances here. Um, early action is just like a priority deadline where if you submit your application by that deadline, you find out early. We want students, every student to apply early action wherever and whenever possible for their list for a number of reasons. One, a lot of colleges fill the majority of their class with early applicants. That's early decision and early action. But with early decision, there is little to no incentive for colleges to offer you money, like merit scholarship money, because you're bound to them no matter what. It doesn't matter what they offer. Early action, on the other hand, if you are a candidate they really want to bring to their school, they're gonna admit you early, hoping that you, you know, put in your deposit early. And they're also more likely to woo you with more money because you're not actually committed yet. Um, it's also really important to understand how much of an incoming class can be filled by these early applications. Um, I think it was Tulane, don't quote me on that. Um, and this is just one example, about 80% of the incoming class is filled through early action and early decision, which leaves very few spots for significantly more applications later. So like the odds of being admitted are very slim. A lot of students ask us if they should do an early decision application because they'd have a better chance at getting in because the numbers kind of look like that. Like I think it was last year, Cornell's early decision rate was 27%, but their regular like overall rate was less than seven. Um, that 27% is incredibly misleading. For one, the students who tend to apply early decision that are qualified applicants tend to be the cream of the crop anyway. They know they wanna go there, they know exactly why, they have done their research, they have put together an impressive application very early on. That makes sense that they would be admitted at a higher rate. There's also far fewer students. So 27% of 100 students is very different than 27% of 49,000 students. Um, there's also the second round that they've brought on. We have our opinions about this. Um, there is now something called early decision two or even early action two, which is a later deadline that is still that uh, commitment, that's still binding contract or that's still like kind of an early acceptance. And there's, there's some pros and cons to both. So like by the time an early decision two application rolls around, that's typically in January, um, students who will apply to that round have either been, they applied early decision somewhere else and didn't get in. So they know that the school is the second on their list, which means that they're much more inclined to enroll. Um, but the other thing to consider is that um, students can apply early action and get all these acceptances and then realize, wow, this other school is something I'd actually really want. Knowing what I already have on the table, I could be happy, but I really want to like put my name in the hat for that binding contract because there is like a slightly better chance because it's demonstrating interest. It's basically saying this is the school for me. Um, other nuances that I don't won't go into in depth unless you have a very specific question about one of these schools. There's something called restricted early action. Um, has different names at different schools, but schools like Stanford um, offer this um, where you can apply to them early action and it's non-binding. So if you get in, you can still you still have your choices. You don't have to withdraw all your other applications like you do with early decision, but there are rules and the rules vary by institution and you must follow these rules. So for Stanford, for example, you are allowed to apply early action to other institutions only when there is a scholarship deadline that requires that early application. Harvard, on the other hand, will allow you to apply early action only to public institutions, no private institutions. Um, and they talk and they will find out and students do not believe us, but we had a student reach out to us um, not that long ago, like towards the beginning of summer and he had his Harvard acceptance rescinded because Harvard talked and found out that he actually applied early action to a few other competitive schools and was offered admission. Um, and it was simply, he tried to appeal and he was denied because he just didn't read the rules. If you can't read the rules, you can't go to Harvard. Um, and to be clear, there is nothing <clears throat> significant or better about these Ivy League institutions than other institutions. What makes a school a good school is that it's a good fit for the student, not that it's just like a good school by ranking because rankings are incredibly arbitrary. 
Um, that's a whole, there's plenty <laughs> of podcasts to listen to about that one, but, um, in general, like, and again, a lot of students have no idea about this, but the Ivy league is purely referring to the sports league in which they play. Um, it has nothing to do with academics. Sure, they are great institutions. Yes, they are well-known names, which there might be some benefit there. But I can tell you, as someone who turned down those Ivy League admission office offers, um, when I ask why should I choose this school over another one, and they say, well, it's Penn or well, it's Harvard, not super inclined to choose that school on my end. <laughs> um, I would like a better reason. And some of those schools are great for certain subject areas and some are great for, um, you know, graduate level work more than undergrad, but really finding those good fit schools, um, that's how you can reap the benefits of those early applications. Then yeah. to condense that down to a shorter version, um, you should think very, very, very hard before you apply anywhere early decision. Um, and you should apply everywhere early action that you can. Um, early action, get it in early, get it back early. So I have your choices, early decision, get it in early. If you are selected, you have to go there. Um, I, was, I, I was actually going to ask a question on that and then you simplifying it. <laughs> I, although, I, you know, I loved the, the big explanation that it was right. really helpful. But now I don't have to ask my question again. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it, we can, we, that's the one of the, the fun and enjoyable things about our job is that there's always so much to learn. There's so much to soak up. Um, but it also means that, that both Jess and I can get a little long winded because everything's so interwoven in this world that like, as you start talking, you're like, oh, well now I have to explain this. And then you go off and off and off. So um, we try and do this even with our blog posts. We try and do like a takeaway at the very end. The kind of, uh, I guess the, the Reddit language is like a too long, didn't read TLDR. Um, we try and do that because it does get a little bit winded and some people love that. Um, other people are kind of like me in the sense that like, they just want to know if X happens, what should I do? Or if X happens, you know, does that affect Y? Um, but there's a, there's a whole conversation to be had about the, um, deliciously interesting world of college admissions and higher ed and how, uh, how marketing and statistics and data analytics and all of that kind of stuff falls into it. If I can ask what school is being thrown around as a possible early decision application? Um, so she hasn't, she hasn't mentioned anything early decision. I think yeah, she's in, in her own world right now. We've been spending um, a lot of time right now actually going, like actually taking her to school. So she is very New York focused and we really kind of want her to explore other cities. So she's only willing to explore cities that are somewhat similar mm -hmm. um so we were just in chicago and we did university of chicago um this weekend we're flying to miami and we're going to do uh university of miami she's also going to be going to la to look at usc and she really wanted um loyola marymount in california but i think now she's possibly leaning towards staying on the East Coast instead. Um, and then we're gonna head to DC because she wants to visit uh, Howard, Georgetown and American. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so yeah. here we are. All I'll say is make sure the list is balanced with likely target and reach schools. Cause mm -hmm. all of the schools that you listed or at least the majority of them are reach schools for any student no matter how okay. high the score or how high the grades. Okay. Um, but also they're all fabulous schools. Yeah. It sounds like she sounds like she needs to be near a city. Um, Philadelphia is not far from home. There's some great schools there, like Drexel. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll take a look at that. But that's I think very it's exciting. She, like hasn't heard about it. So we're, we're trying to right. get her to as yeah. many places to see as possible. Um, but that could definitely be a good option. I'll, I'll look into that with her. Yeah. Very cool. Carla, you're in Brooklyn, right? Mm-hmm. You're, yep. Okay. Great. Great. We're all super, very close to each other. <laughs> well, both of us are close to each other. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we are also close to each other, just, you know, half a country away. <laughs> yeah. I was born in Manhattan, though. So, there's ah. that. 
awesome. Um, so, uh, Carla, did you have any other questions? No. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for the questions. Um, yes. So just one other question. I know, um, Jessica, swear you guys had created a video, a whole other video about this, which we'll link uh, to, but I was wondering if you could very, very briefly, because I know this doesn't apply to Carla, um, talk about the difference between a technical school and a, like reg going to regular four-year high school. And if that decreases the chances of you going to a like institute, like a four-year private right. institution or even public. Yeah, so we can talk a little bit about this and we'll abbreviate it and hopefully not contradict ourselves too much with the other video we did. Um, but generally this depends a lot on what a student's interested in doing. So if you want to do engineering in the sense of like um, corporate jobs, um, government work, like stuff like that, you are almost always going to need to go through a traditional high school experience and then go to a college. Um, and then most likely, uh, very likely, you're probably going to need to get a master's or higher degree. So you'll even have more education after that, that undergraduate degree. And some schools can kind of uh, speed that up. Um, some schools can um, partner with others. So you might hear the phrase three, two a lot which the idea is you might go to a smaller college and spend three years there studying like math and physics. And then you spend two years at like a larger partner university, um, something that's gonna have the resources for engineering students. Um, so there's a lot of different paths, but if you wanna do that kind of engineering work, um, that is going to be something that is going to require a, a more traditional path. Um, it's really hard to break into the engineering world and especially the workforce with, really with anything less than a master's unless you have some really outstanding uh, abilities like you're a um you know you're a, you're a one in a million kind of person and tar is like just some ability you have and that they need you for um or unless you have very very well known and well connected connections that can sometimes help um but i mean to find a job with anything less than a master's that's going to pay a significant living wage and like be at a respectable company you're going to be hard pressed to find that um so that would be if you wanted to go like that traditional engineering route I think the the most important piece to that question is um, a GED to a competitive four year engineering program is not a typical route and you would need a very good reason to go that route than to do your traditional high school diploma and then the four year degree. There's nothing wrong with technical school or community college. They're great options. They're often less expensive, but they're they're just a stepping stone. Oftentimes technical college, not so much, um, but there aren't typically like engineering degrees at technical colleges. That's like a very like specialized kind of thing. Um, and there are, so, there are some incredible technical colleges out there. The things, there's a lot of red flags at some of them. Um, you wanna make sure they're accredited, things like that. Um, but in general, if you are trying to get that engineering route, you wanna do that more traditional high school diploma, max out your classes in high school, dual enroll if you can. Um, and then either do that kind of liberal arts education leading to engineering or straight into that engineering program. And then once again, that's for more of that traditional engineering route. If you wanted to go technical school to learn like a trade or a trade school, that is a viable path. It's a path that is going to probably be a lot shorter and it's probably going to give you decent job security and you'll probably make decent money depending on what you kind of successfully train for your trade. Um, those are really good options for students, especially if students just are interested in like, if a student loves like working with their hands and like welding, um, then like, and they hate school and they hate class and they hate all these subjects, there is a discussion to be had. Like they could get a really successful career and a solid job, start making money much earlier um, and have like a viable skill that they can uh, apply to jobs for. Um, so that's kind of that divided path. Is it, is it the more traditional engineering or do you want like a trade that might be considered like part of an engineering scheme? Um, both of them are viable, just different paths for different students. Yeah. And Carla, Probably you said you, you had say one more. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So you mentioned that, Jessica, I think you mentioned that all those schools that I named were 
reach schools and you said she should have some target schools. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me the difference? Yeah, so we define reach schools as any school that admits fewer than 20% of their applicants. That means it's a reach school for anyone, no matter how qualified you are. Um, There are far more valedictorians in this country than there are spots at every one of those schools that you've listed, um, just for like perspective purposes. Um, So what a balanced list looks like is every school on the list should be a school that the student wants to go to, that they would love to be at, that they would thrive at, where they would have access to everything that they're looking for, where they'll be successful, they'll have their networking, internships, whatever. Um, what that looks like though, for most families um, to like give something a label, a likely school is a school that you're likely to be admitted to. Typically the likely schools, if we're talking about numbers, you, that's when the students GPA and test scores are within that top 25% range where you can anticipate pretty high um, you know, merit scholarships or an honors program, that kind of thing. The target schools are more where the student falls within that middle 50%. Um, And this gets dicey when it gets to those schools that admit fewer than 20% of students, because if you've got that 1550, that doesn't mean you have a better shot at Harvard than if you had a perfect score. Um, It's meaningless at that point. It's it's like throwing your name in a hat and that's it. Um, At a certain point, it is pretty much just luck or connections or something else. Um, So I think that it's, it's not super cut and dry to define and you can talk to a thousand counselors and get 999 different responses. Um, But it's really important to make sure that that one, every school on the list is a school that the student wants to go to because at the end of the day, we've had many students who only have their likely schools and there's nothing wrong with a likely school. It doesn't mean that it's a lesser institution. It doesn't mean it provides a lesser education. Um, There's, we have students who choose their likely schools because it's a full ride or because they have access to a specific lab or something else on campus. Um, That balance is really important though, because the worst thing that can happen, and we've seen it happen when students don't listen to us, um, students wind up waitlisted everywhere or wind up with zero acceptances. And that's the worst case scenario. And that that's a bigger punch in the gut than a few rejections and then still having options. So for example, like a student who's interested in schools like USC, Loyola Marymount, like Loyola, if you're interested in USC and Georgetown and like some of those like really selective institutions, um, a Loyola Marymount's probably more in that target range. Um, So would like Chapman, Gonzaga, um, University of San Diego, that's all kind of like, those schools are all similar in different ways. Um, But then like a likely school, if your student has a 4.0, University of Arizona will guarantee that student a full ride scholarship, like a full tuition scholarship. And it's a great school. And if you're in the honors program and you are at the top of the class, you're the one who will have access to every opportunity on campus and things like that. Um, And that's a likely school because they basically say, if you've got this 4.0, we'll give you this full tuition. And that's basically uh, as guaranteed an acceptance as possible when in a world where we quite literally cannot guarantee anything. Yeah. And the only thing I would add there is I know for a lot of families because of rankings and the news and the media, like acceptance rates tend to be how they define like a highly selective or not school. Um, For most students, the more accurate representation, don't worry about acceptance rates. Look at what that middle 50% of their academic class is. And where do you fall in that? Um, At GPA, um, academic rigor, so like dual enrollment, IB, AP, advanced courses, um, test scores, if that's something a student wants to participate with. Um, those are much better indicators because, because very much like most of the numbers in the college admission world, acceptance rates can be deceiving and even manipulated. Um, an acceptance rate to a large university might be very high and acceptance rate to a particular program in that university might be as difficult as an Ivy League, um, which is pretty crazy. I know we always use University of Washington. I think if you look on paper, their acceptance rate across the board is is fairly high. It's like 66 to 70 percent. If you are applying to their computer science program or computer engineering, um, it's it's well beneath 5 percent of an acceptance rate. 
And then um, if you're applying from out of state, it's even less. Yeah. So that's the other thing too, is acceptance rate for in-state versus out of state. So there's a lot of different factors that go into acceptance rate that can sometimes be misleading because we don't get provided the full picture without you know, dedicating your entire career to it, <laughs> um, which most people don't have the time to do. Um, and so that's something that I would usually say is like, look at the academics, look at the academic threshold. Um, and that will oftentimes really help a family figure out, okay, what school do we feel really comfortable with? What school is like, we're kind of in the middle 50% and what school we might actually be like in the middle 50% for, but that middle 50% is nearly perfect across the board. Um, in which case, it doesn't matter how great you are, it's gonna come down to those institutional priorities we talked about. And if you're looking for help trying to balance that list, send us an email and we are happy, like give us the list of schools of interest and we're happy to throw out some others that will yeah. be similar in a lot of ways, but might be more in that target likely range. That was actually my next question. <laughs> so I will definitely be shooting you guys an email. Thank you. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, could you guys actually put your email addresses yeah. in the chat? Um, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Let me try and make it as simple as possible. So um, I say that as I spell check myself. Um, so our website is www.virtualcollegecounselors.com. Our emails are Sawyer at virtualcollegecounselors.com and Jessica at virtualcollegecounselors.com. Um, obviously we work one-on-one -on -one with students. We also work in schools and things, um, but we cannot emphasize this enough. We have a lot of resources on our website. Um, I mean, we have 60 plus blogs and growing. Um, almost every question we've answered, there's a blog for it on our website. Um, we also have resources for like online volunteering opportunities, scholarship search engines, different resources people can use to do the college search. Um, we want to help as many students and families as possible. We can't do it because we are only two people. We have a limited amount of bandwidth. And at the end of the day, we have to pay, you know, rent and mortgage and feed ourselves. Um, but this is our way of kind of giving back to the larger community is we produce a lot of content like these webinars and these blogs and these resources so that no matter who you are, no matter what your socioeconomic situation, no matter where you're located, um, you can still get some help. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, no, thank you for coming and asking such good questions. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Jessica Sawyer. I'm going to ask that you guys stay on for a few minutes after. Um, but Carla, everyone else who's watching, thank you so much for, for coming. Um, I put a type form in the chat. Uh, so Carla would love to get your feedback on today. Um, we're always looking for more ways to improve. Um, if, you, if anyone has recommendations on events, topics, speakers, whatever it is, um, please email me. My email is rena at she.community. Our general email is hello at she.community. Our information is all on our website. Um, and we will be hosting monthly parent discussion groups uh, moving forward. Some will be based off of, based on academics, college admissions, but um, we also have uh, a few child and adolescent psychologists on our team. They come in and they, you know, if, you know, if you're having any questions about your teenagers, but, you know, don't want to, maybe don't want to book an appointment with a therapist yet, or don't want to go to, go to don't want to go to the clinical route, um, you know, you can always jump on these calls and get any of your questions answered. And then we're also going to be running um, teen focused programming. So uh, a couple of workshops on body image, um, on how to figure out what you want to do in the future. Uh, we're also going to bring be bringing in current college students to talk uh, this fall about their experiences going to college and their journeys and they're not they're not too much older many of them are freshmen sophomores juniors in college so um, yeah we stay stay uh, stay up to date and you know we'll keep texting emailing you on uh, all of the things that are happening with us looking forward to it awesome. thanks everyone thank you, Carla. Yeah, thank you bye Bye.